Cheers. Here we go. 2020 wrap up video. Uh, I, I do this every year. Hopefully you guys have seen some of them uh, where I go through and I talk about some of my favorite images that I made that year. And I give a little like disclaimer that these are my favorite images of the year. Not necessarily even my best photos that I made, but uh, typically they are. But there are some exceptions where I just had a great experience making a particular photo, even though it didn't turn out particularly well or something. So anyway, these are my favorite images that I made. Uh, there are going to be 20 of them. And it's not all going to happen in one video. So this is part one. Um, I'll kind of jump into like 2020. Weird, right? So the, the pandemic, of course, made everything very weird. But 2020 started out pretty great. Greatly? Pretty greatly. Pretty well. Lovely. Uh, had uh, some awesome experiences with a winter workshop in Yellowstone in January. And then I spent three weeks in February in Africa. And then uh, at spring break in Hawaii with my kids. And then the pandemic happened. Bang! Right then. So then everything came to a screeching halt. So started out like a magnificent year. And then... Uh, got weird. During that weirdness, though, um, I, I felt like I had a bunch of time to work on some projects that felt like they were never going to get done or worked on. So I, I kind of looked at it as an opportunity to get caught up on some things and use that free time. You know, our, our national parks were closed. even We couldn't even get in the gates to do photography or get out and go for a hike or anything, which more weirdness. Uh, I don't know why that was closed. But um, anyway, I, that was uh, a kind of an opportunity that I, I looked at in a positive way of I have some time to get some stuff done and that'll be great. Uh, also during the pandemic, 2020 last year, I got engaged to Stephanie. Um, so somehow I managed to convince her that I'm a pretty decent guy. And uh, anyway, we're very happy together and uh, that's all going great. So that was probably the, the highlight of the year, I'd say. It was uh, that's a cool thing that happened during the, the pandemic, for sure. Photographically, it was also a weird year. I guess you'd kind of expect that with having weird things in life. The photography will feel a little bit weird as well, and it definitely did. Um, I certainly, I don't feel like I made my best photos that I've ever made this year. Oh, the light just changed. That's what happens when you use natural lighting from the window. Sun goes behind a cloud and the lighting changes. Anyway, back to photographically how I felt this year. I just felt uncomfortable kind of all year. And I, I can't really explain why. Uh, I, I didn't feel like I did my best work this year. And uh, I, I did a lot of workshops this year, private workshops here in the Tetons. And... Uh, so I did a lot of teaching, a lot of workshops, and got a lot of fulfillment out of that. And uh, I feel like I did some great work out there in that regard. I certainly made some great photos, um, but I felt like I was getting a lot more fulfillment out of having my students uh, learn and get better and make great photos as well. So obviously you can't see that necessarily in the photos that you're going to see here today. But uh, that was, I think... You know, part of it, I miss a lot of photo opportunities when I'm out in the field because I'm there to make sure my student gets the best photos. And there are times when I make photos when I'm out with clients, um, if there's an opportunity for me to get out my camera and shoot as well. And uh, certainly some of these photos were made on those workshops as well. Uh, but it definitely um, makes me get fewer opportunities out in the field when I'm making sure my students get the priority out there. So I was feeling just a little uncomfortable out there, kind of all year, really. And I didn't really contemplate why, but I noticed that it was happening. So um, I now can look back on that and kind of see why I was feeling a little uncomfortable. And that definitely affected my photography. So. I think I was a little uncomfortable out there with shooting the obvious subjects 
and the obvious compositions and making the obvious photos. Uh, you know, I wasn't getting satisfaction out of that like I have in the past. And so I started trying new things to try and feel some, some more satisfaction. Like I was getting more satisfaction out of going out with clients and helping them make nice photos. Um, so I, somehow, subconsciously, I just started taking pictures of different things in different ways, in different places, and looking for just something different. Uh, and I didn't really necessarily think about that. But looking back, I can see that that's what I was doing. And a consequence of that was trying new things means you're going to make a lot of mistakes, uh, which I did. And you're going to like kind of waste a lot of time in, in some sense you know, experimentation and, um, you know, failure. And so I definitely went through that. And I, I kind of just didn't feel satisfied with very many of those photos, even though, you know, in hindsight, looking back on them there, some of them are actually good photos, but I just was really uncomfortable making them. And so I, I had a hard time feeling great about some of those photos. But uh, I'm getting, you know, it's late March now. And so I've had a few months to kind of process the year a little bit. So I'm kind of glad I waited to do this video because it's given me some better perspective on the year than I would have had if I had just made it, you know, on January 1st or 2nd or something like that. So in hindsight, I think the uncomfortableness was the learning curve, you know, getting out of my comfort zone and making those mistakes um, and you know, getting out of your comfort zone is, it's uncomfortable by definition. So that's what I think I was going through a lot of the year last year. Um, anyway, uh, something's changing with my photography over the last year or so. I, I feel it now and I'm aware of it now. So I'm watching it more closely to see what that brings. But uh, I just thought I'd talk about that a little bit, let you know what's happening there. And with, uh, you know, my year in review, it's kind of a big, yeah, just a big theme of, what the year was about photographically, the images that I made, my thought processes, and all that kind of stuff. So hopefully that, that didn't bore you to death uh, and that it helps you understand the year and helps you understand maybe me talking through some of the images. So anyway, I'm paying attention now and we'll just kind of see, see where things lead here as 2021 goes on. But I'm having a wonderful 2021 and making a lot of great images, having a lot of fun out there. So it's all good news. It's looking, it's looking good. So anyway, I, I hope I didn't spoil any of the, you know, this, this 2020 top 20, the 2020 top 20 uh, video for you this year by kind of, uh, you know, maybe downplaying some of the images. Because I, I do truly love these images, and, but I had a weird year, probably like most of you did. So uh, anyway, on to the images. Let's, let's look at this. I, 2020 started with a bang. Uh, on January 8th at 4.02 p.m., a wild mountain lion came screaming down the hillside towards its carcass to uh, swipe some ravens and magpies off of its kill. Right here in the town limits of Jackson, Wyoming. And it was incredible. It lasted a very short time. And uh, I shot... I don't know how many hundreds of images I got to see it run up and down the hill and chase the birds off twice. And then it kind of retreated for the next few days up into the trees. But uh, anyway, magnificent experience, magnificent photos came out of it. Kind of almost once in a lifetime type stuff. And anyway, I, I had a hard time picking which was my favorite image of this scene and the sequence. I chose this one just some of the things that I liked in particular about it was the intensity of the gaze as he's approaching that carcass to scare the other scavengers off of the carcass. So it's the intensity of the stare. It's that gigantic paw lifted off the snow. And then there were several frames that looked very similar to this, but its tail was hidden behind its body. And in this one, you can see the tail sticking out there to the right. So this is about the intensity of the gaze, the powerful posture. You can see kind of the the musculature of the animal, and it's a magnificent creature. Uh, I just feel so lucky to have been able to see it up this close and make some photos of it in a, you know, in a safe situation 
um, where it was behaving naturally. I mean, just it doesn't happen like this very often. Unless you're Savannah. If you're pre following Savannah on Instagram, you should. She's had an absolutely incredible year photographing mountain lions here in the Tetons. So I'll link to her in the description. Uh, but anyway, this was my favorite shot of that day. And what a way to start the year. So this, uh, this image was, I'll give you the, uh, ooh, there we go. This was shot on the Nikon D850 with the 600 millimeter F4. Uh, F4, ISO 800, one one thousandth of a second. And I don't know what else to say about it. It's just a, it's a magnificent animal in a magnificent pose. So can't go wrong with that. That has to be in the top 20. All right, next image comes from Yellowstone National Park. And this was taken on my winter workshop uh, with a group of participants. We all had a blast and we had an amazing time with these weasels, um, long-tailed weasels commonly called ermine. And we found a few of them and I made some great photos of these beautiful creatures. This one I loved in particular with the clean snow uh, it's, you know, the blue shady part of the snow, and then it, it happened to stop and look back. I don't know what it was looking at over there. Um, maybe it was looking at Ralph. Ralph was over there taking a picture of it, I think. Um, but anyway, as it popped its head up, this little, you know, direct sunlight, a little beam of direct sunlight came over the hill and lit up its face. It was perfect. It stood there for about a second and a half and then darted off again. That's, that's how they roll. But uh, I was able to make this photo, and it's just wonderful. So it's simple, it's clean, and then, you know, that, that little shaft of light right on its eyeball, right on its head, just bang. You know, that's the, the pop of light that it needed in an otherwise pretty flat, dull light situation. That's, that's the pop. So I love it. It's just clean, it's simple, uh, a beautiful animal, beautiful light, beautiful environment. Can't go wrong there. Uh, this was also with the Nikon D850 and the 600 millimeter F4. This was at one eight hundredth of a second F4 ISO 800. And in hindsight, uh, I probably should have doubled my shutter speed there to a sixteen hundredth of a second just because these things are moving so fast. Uh, and taking my ISO to 1600 wouldn't have been a problem. So uh, anyway, th there's the, uh, the EXIF data. It turned out wonderful. Another one from the same trip in Yellowstone. Um, with the same group of people. This is actually a different weasel and on a different day, but this was, uh, this was a guy that came out and he gave us a magnificent show for like a half hour. He was running around, popping up over here, popping over there. Then he popped out of the snow with this uh, little vole. I'm not sure what that is, a meadow vole maybe, uh, in his mouth and he stood up and showed it to us and then he ran off with it. And I, you know, we all got amazing photos of that, that whole sequence and this was my favorite of that particular sequence, all four legs off the ground, snow flying with its uh, prey in its mouth and showing the size of the predator versus the size of the prey. It's very impressive. And so anyway, I this is such a great image. It has to be in this top 20 for me, for sure. Uh, EXIF data here was Nikon D850, the 600 millimeter F4, one twenty-five hundredth of a second f4 iso 1600 so that's a more appropriate shutter speed than one eight hundredth of a second um, this would have been blurry at one eight hundredth of a second on some level you know i might have panned perfectly and got a little bit of motion blur with it but this is definitely where i would like to be with that shutter speed for this little small quick moving critter oh we've left the continent now now we're on to africa and um, elephants, obviously. So the first place we went to in Africa was Amboseli. And the, you know, the, the primary thing you go to Amboseli for is elephants. And obviously there's cheetahs and leopards and th there's everything else there too. And it's an amazing place. But the elephants are kind of the star of the show there. And we happened to find a bunch of babies and while this one isn't a baby, I, I was keying in on the small elephants. For some reason, I just fell in love with the baby elephants, and I was uh, shooting like crazy. I overshot them. I shot way too many baby elephant photos. 
And uh, anyway, this one was one of those things where I was trying something, you know, a little bit different uh, with the slow shutter speed here. And I kind of wanted an image of a mom and its calf, you know, walking in the motion blurry kind of situation. And I, they're harder than you think to make work. But I finally, I shot this one and I, I decided that I liked it. It was my favorite one of that particular situation with the motion blur youngster uh, cow and calf. And, uh, you know, the, the blurriness is perfect. Um, the setup with the small and the large and then the curly trunk kind of was like the, the icing on the cake for this image that makes it one of my favorites versus just one of a cool photo that I made on the trip. This is, again, the Nikon D850 and 600mm f4. Uh, I'm at ISO 90. Don't ask me why. I think I probably was trying to get to ISO 64 and I just missed. F11 and 1 sixth of a second. So pretty slow. Sixth of a second there. But it worked out great. Okay, and now, you know, same story there. The baby elephants were kind of what... I fell in love with there in Amboseli. Uh, here's another one. And this, this is a very young baby. And they had just come out of the swamp. And so the, you know, they're kind of wet and kind of dry. And I went high key black and white on this one. Uh, I shot a whole series as these two walked across the landscape like that. This was my favorite one because of the light positions. Uh, very much matched each other. Like almost perfectly the light positions of mom and the calf are the same and the other ones have them kind of you know right leg front left leg back kind of different so this was like you know baby emulating mama kind of thing um, anyway so this was my favorite photo of the trip of the baby elephants i just thought it was super cute and like tells a story of the mama and the baby and the baby trying to be like mama and it's great. Guess what? Nikon D850 and 600mm f4. This one was 1 400th of a second f8 ISO 400. Still in Africa. That's a giraffe. We don't have those here in the Tetons. And they're lovely. This was uh, taken on the infrared converted camera. This was a Fuji X-T20 with an infrared conversion. And that infrared conversion makes foliage turn white. You know, in, in normal, with all that foliage being green, this is such a different looking scene. But this was like a perfect scene for infrared in that it would turn all that foliage white and kind of detailless, and then really given that punch to the giraffe and the tree trunks that don't turn white under infrared light. So anyway, I shot it both ways in color and in infrared, and without a doubt, the infrared was the way to shoot it. I think it turned out beautifully. Uh, the giraffe just gave, gave us a pose that was perfect. And... Uh, Bob was right in there next to me, uh, one of the work workshop participants, and uh, he made some great photos of this scene as well. We, we just had a blast photographing this giraffe. So, uh, lovely image there. This one was shot, as I said, with the Fuji X-T20 in infrared converted by LifePixel. This was at f5.6, ISO 400, and 1 320th of a second. Focus on the giraffe and push the button and have a nice day. It turned out great. This is another infrared giraffe image. And I'd kind of been looking for an image similar to this in my head. I think I'd seen something uh, similar done by David Dushman, who he's, a, he's an excellent photographer and teacher. Um, I bought several of his books, and I've taken some of his online courses and stuff, so I consider him, I've never met him or anything, I don't know him at all, but I definitely consider him a mentor in a way, just uh, I appreciate his imagery and his teachings and, and that kind of thing. But anyway, he had made a, a, a kind of similar giraffe photo that I really loved, that I had seen before I went to Africa, and in my head I was like, I'm going to be on the lookout for something like that. 
And so here, here's what I found out there. This was uh, a giraffe that was um, in the savanna without too many trees around it. So I was able to get a clean shot of just the giraffe. And then there were very few clouds for most of the trip, but, you know, no, noticed a cloud, you know, down that way a little bit and the giraffe heading that way. So we had the, uh, the driver of the land, um, land cruiser back up and we waited for the giraffe to come in front of that cloud. So we went and set up at the cloud and waited for the giraffe to come in and then bang, made that photo. So it worked out really well. And it's, uh, it's one of those just, just kind of a cool juxtaposition. It's simple and it's clean. The, the subject's very obvious, but there's a little bit of a mm, unexpected in that, you know, you, you expect the clouds to be above the animal, unless it's a bird. But in this case, it works because it's a giraffe and they're so tall and they've got this huge long neck. And so uh, it just, it feels, it's still, it's a little bit like, you know, uh, it's a little unexpected, but not really because giraffes are so tall. So anyway, that's what I love about this photo. Simple, clean, and just a little bit unexpected. And thanks to David Dushman for planting that little seed in my head before I went to Africa so that I saw this and uh, was able to make this photo. Uh, this one was taken with that same infrared converted Fuji X-T20 F5.6 ISO 400, but EXIF data on the shutter speed's gone. Poor planning on my part for not noticing that before I started the video. Okay, still in Africa. Uh, my first rhinoceros. I got to see a wild rhinoceros and I'm very happy about it. And I'm extra happy that uh, it, it gave us a situation where I could make a photo that I loved. And I, I made a big print of this, six feet wide, that's in my bedroom upstairs over the headboard. So I love it that much. I made a, a nice print of it and it's in my bedroom. Anyway, this rhinoceros was in, in Gorongoro Crater and made some lovely photos of it, environmental, you know, with some of the mountains of the crater behind it. Lovely atmospherics, a little bit of fog back there. It was a beautiful morning. And a simple shot, really, you know, as it grazes once in a while, lifts its head, and then bang, 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 make that photo. And uh, I loved it. So this was, again, Nikon D850, 600mm f4, f5, ISO 64, 1 one twenty fifth of a second. Now, 1 one twenty fifth of a second is slower than most people would recommend you shoot a 600mm f4. Uh, I did that on purpose. I put ISO at 64 on purpose because I knew having that scene in front of me and having time to think about it, that I was going to make a big print of this. So I wanted to maximize my image quality and I had the time to do this and enough light to do this that I set that up specifically for maximum image quality. Uh, I wanted the background to be nice and soft. This lens is just a tiny bit sharper at f5 than f4, so that's why I stopped down to f5. I didn't want the mountains in the background to be sharp, but I the extra sharpness that that f4 to f5 gives you I did want um, for that just the maximum image quality that I could possibly get out of this and I had time to set up for that so that's what I did and I'm glad I did because I'm I can make huge prints of it and they look amazing 